Hey, uh, welcome to another episode of From the Chamber. I'm your host, Cade Roberts, and we have a really special episode today. Not only a special guest, but a really great co-host. Follow me to the church. All right, so today we're joined by a really special co-host, Teresa Knox. Hi. Yeah, and if she plays her cards just right, we may let her come back. Uh, oh, thanks. <laughs> and then we have a very special guest today. Uh, a lot of you may know, um, award-winning instrumentalist, jazz saxophone extraordinaire, Grady Nichols. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Yeah, so uh, let's start Let's start right at the top. Where did you get your start? Where you grew up in Arkansas, I believe. Yes. Yeah. You know, Arkansas is, is a, a jazz mecca. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, no, it, it was, it was actually, um, it was interesting to grow up in Arkansas yeah. and have such an affection for, uh, the saxophone mm -hmm. because, um, part of learn, you know, growing up in the eighties, uh, a lot of the information was not as readily available it is, as it is now. I couldn't just go to YouTube. How do I figure an Altissimo G sharp? Yeah. You know, that makes, makes that wasn't there. And there really, some of the things I wanted to do, I really couldn't find any help um, in Northwest Arkansas uh, while in high school. And uh, what I used to do, one of my favorite saxophone player ever was David Sanborn. Oh, yeah. For sure. You know, just, so good. He, he, he's played with everybody. Mm -hmm. And, um, he would be on Letterman all the time, uh, NBC Letterman. And so I would I would videotape all the bumpers, the intros and outros, and they were like maybe 30 seconds. But I would watch how he was fingering some of those altissimo notes. Wow. And so some of the notes I learned just because I would freeze the VCR. <laughs> and <laughs> okay, it looks like he's got, you know, and that that's how I how I learned some of it. But wow. Um, but growing up in Arkansas was, was, I also had some experiences that I, you know, growing up in a big city, you probably wouldn't have because I would, we lived on acreage. And so I would go out in the backyard and, and there would just be nothing but acres. Yeah. And I would, I'd play for hours and it would, um, carry for miles. Yeah. I didn't know how many miles until um, <laughs> one day for whatever reason I was, I decided to switch to the front yard. And uh, I was playing in the front yard, and a car slowly drives up. Windows are down, and it's two guys. And they're like, how are you doing? <laughs> Good. We're from Warner Brothers. Oh, no, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, wow. <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> Record executive heard you were hiding <laughs> out in Arkansas in Silent Springs. <laughs> but no, they were, they were cops. They were oh. police officers. <laughs> and they said, we've been listening... <laughs> We've, we've been on a stakeout about three miles from here, and um, we like what we're, what you're doing, but we got a complaint from, there's a little old lady who sleeps with her window open, and it's too loud. And I said, <laughs> you know what, I will, I'll, I'll go in the backyard. <laughs> there's nobody that way, so I'll, I'll go back there. Um, but no, I just, I uh, was really, really uh, driven just to, to, to learn more about the saxophone and try and get better. Cause I just, I just, from the very beginning, I, I hearing it in the car as a little kid with my parents, I just was like, man, what, what is that? Yeah. What is that instrument? And I just, it just had me from an early age. Yeah. And I'm, I'm always interested in people that have those stories because, you know, as we talked about on here in the past, I'm a multi-instrumentalist. I've never felt drawn to any one particular instrument almost to a fault. You know, where it's like, because you can only go so far with you, when you spread yourself that thin, you know, it seems like. Mm -hmm. But but I've always just loved songwriting and this music as a whole. But I'm always really interested in people that they have such a love for one instrument. And I think it, it, it allows you to get to a level where you can express yourself so richly through that instrument. You know, you can get connected with it mm -hmm. uh, the way you do. So, and it sounds like, I was going to ask you about that. Like, what drew you to the saxophone? What well, sounds like you just were always drawn to it from the time you were a little kid and, yeah, I, I really can't explain it. I, I The only thing I can think of is just God put that little thing. Your your ears are going to like that sound. Yeah. And and that's kind of 
Didn't you meet David Sanborn early on? I did. Yeah. Um, and I would say this, it's so awesome when you get to meet one of your heroes and they're more than what you thought they'd be. You know, they're just like... <laughs> He's incredible. His sound is so oh, distinct. Yeah. I mean, it's just when I heard that sound, I was just like, dude, what? Who is that? <laughs> yeah. You know, it just, I, could, I couldn't believe it. Um, but he is, is such a humble guy and he's just a player. I mean, he's he's a great player. I I met him in high school for the first time. Um, I I went to um, a concert when we used to have the floating amphitheater stage here in Tulsa at at uh, River Parks, and it was an outdoor concert. And it was it was life changing. You know, I saw him play, and I saw the crowd's reaction, and I was like, I'd love to do this. This would be so cool. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I met him years later when I was in college. I used to have, uh, I went to school at John Burn University. We have a a, um, a radio station there, a Christian radio station called KLRC. Mm -hmm. So I, I went to my professor, part of, and my degrees in broadcasting. So part of the degree is you've got to have radio experience, which means you need to do a couple of shifts on the air. So I went to my professor and I said, hey, can I do a jazz show on KLRC? <laughs> Would that be okay? And he said, yeah. I and mean, what year was that? Um, I think 92, mm. 93, somewhere in there. The pre-explosion of the jazz radio station. <laughs> yes. It really exactly. was. It, it's very true. And um, so I... He said yes, so I had this little show called Night Music that was on Wednesday nights from 10 to midnight. Romantic. And I, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I would, I would play all these you know, uh, jazz songs on the radio. But what it gave me the opportunity to do is, as a college student, you, know, you don't have a lot of money, so you've got all the record labels sending you, play this, play this. I'm getting boxes and boxes of CDs. By all these jazz artists, some I've like never heard of ever. And so I'm just like, oh, this is great. <laughs> you know, I'm like a kid in a candy store. Yeah. But uh, but when there were times when I remember three distinct concerts because they were they were if I had to pick three artists that were the most influential at that time to me, they all came through town. They they either played in northwest Arkansas or they played over here in Tulsa. Sam Ward played the Brady. I, I talked to his record label. Um, I said, I have a show over here. People come from Arkansas all the time to Tulsa to see shows. I'd like to promote it for you. I'm like, great. So they sent me tickets, and we did giveaways, and I played a bunch of his songs, and I got to meet him uh, at backstage at the Brady. And he was just so encouraging and so... Um, it, it, that was another life changing moment because it's like here's this guy that you look up to and and part of part of growing as a musician you you know this you you pick somebody that you love and you want to emulate them but then you get to a point where you realize there already is a David Sample I've yeah. got to figure out who I am I've got to figure out what I can do that's different mm -hmm. but he was just so encouraging and positive and he just he didn't talk to me like I was a you know a college kid. Yeah. He just talked to me like I was a musician. Wow. Artist to artist. Yeah. And um, so he was wonderful. And then um, Kenny G played the Maybe Center, I think, a year later. So I got to meet him. Wow, cool. And then uh, Spira Gyra played in uh, Northwest Arkansas. So I got to meet their horn player, Jay Beckenstein. And so, you know, what an opportunity. I mean, who, who gets to do that? Right? Yeah. <laughs> you it's know? amazing. So it was just, it was just, uh, just a wonderful experience to have that show and then be able to um, meet those artists that I'd listened to for years. Yeah. Cool. And I, and I, when I was researching you, you know, I've actually heard a lot of your music before I realized I'd heard it because uh, 107.9 years ago when I was in high school, smooth jazz Tulsa. Yeah. <clears throat> that was like all I listened to in my car driving around. Thank you for that. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't know. I just got like so you. into that. And then, and then later, I, I discovered you, Grady Nichols, and all that. And I, I, I began to know oh, who this guy was and stuff, you know. Of course, I didn't know who all was playing on there back then. But right. uh, 
so I got really into it. I got into David Sanborn, all that cool stuff too. Um, and yeah, I was just, I, I read on an interview that you talked about how you kind of got your start right around the time you were talking about radio and how you did your first record and it got airplay and, mm-hmm. and it kind of like your career has really been driven through radio in a lot of ways. It sounds like. Yeah. I mean, you know, you'll hear a lot of artists talk about, um, the right place, the right time. I mean, there really is a lot of, a lot of truth to that because, mm-hmm. um, I was working on this. I, you get, you know, as you, as you grow your career, you get all kinds of advice from people about what they think you should do. And yeah, our first CD was, um, kind of a hybrid of, we, we recorded a live, uh, show at Utica square and then we did some studio cuts and I thought then here comes, uh, the Oasis, uh, jazz radio station. So I, I went up there and I, I met with the general manager and I just said, Hey, I've got this jazz record. And, you know, I didn't know how, <laughs> I didn't know how the business worked or how radio worked or yeah. how you got on the radio. And I just said, um, w- you know, would you like me to, I'd, I'd love to put your logo on my record. Cause I think you're, I think we're talking to the same people here. Um, and then would you be interested in playing it? And they did, you know, so here this new station uh, comes on in Tulsa and that format, like you were saying, Teresa, really, uh, started to kind of blossom as a, as a Mm -hmm. commercial format for the first time. And, um, so we got played there and that was great because suddenly every venue in Tulsa was looking for this kind of music. And so we, we and all were, over the country. Mm-hmm. Really? Yeah. So it, it was kind of a gradual progression, um, because we, there was one in Oklahoma city. So we would do stuff for KT and T I believe it was. And then we would go to Wichita and then it would just kind of, you know, expand from there. And then, and then you, you started to learn about, okay, what kind of music are they looking for? You know, that there, there became a, a certain sound that, <laughs> would get you on the radio. And so yeah. you kind of learned more about that too. Mm-hmm. What happened? I mean, what happened to smooth jazz? <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I mean, thank God for watercolors. I love that on Sirius right. and we get to hear you on that. Yeah. It's, we, we still get played on there and, and, um, I need to do a new one, but that we're working on that. <laughs> yeah. Number eight, right? <laughs> yeah. It'd be number eight. Yeah. But, um, you know, I think a couple of things, um, as I learned more about the business of radio, you know, um, there are consulting firms and they basically tell the PD because, you know, you're in the age of consolidation where a big media company owns eight radio stations in a market or, or less, you know, probably less. And they can only have, you can't hire eight or five different program directors for each station. So that, mm-hmm. so you'd have a program director that's in charge of multiple stations. Well, you know, everything is driven by what? Money. Yeah. Advertising money. So if your ratings aren't working in radio, that's typically a reflection of the kind of music that you're playing. So PDs and companies would hire consultants that would say, well, we consult this kind of radio format. This is what our research says you should play. So um, they would, uh, that's kind of how it would work. And so what happened with smooth jazz is, is you had too many, and this is just my opinion, but you had too many different things at work that made it not work. Uh, one, it was very passive. You know, they, they liked the idea of... Um, Smooth Jazz, 105.3, The Oasis. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, and then, you know, and then, that was that. perfect. And then the, then the song, then three or four songs would play and you wouldn't know who they were. Mm-hmm. And then, and then they would maybe say, they would come back in. Okay. Hey, that was, um, it was David Sanborn with Slam and, you know, next. But so you just... So to me, it was like, well, why not make it just like a regular, hey, that's a new one from Brian Colbert, and that's a new one from so-and-so, and and just have it be like any other radio station. Um, Because what happens if you create a passive format, well, then your advertising is passive. Yeah. 
And so, you know, if advertise, so then if advertising isn't working for your customers and they're on radio, well, then the format starts to die. So you had a combination of things where they loved oldies. They thought they thought vocal tunes would be hooks to bring people in who didn't necessarily like jazz. So mm -hmm. if you're a if you're a jazz person and you hear, let's say Grover Washington, Boney James, then Mariah Carey. Mm. That just that doesn't, you're, <laughs> it's you're, too you're, wide. You're yeah. trying to make too many people happy, mm -hmm. and it's right. so it's really it's just not going to work. So you had a lot of that, and it really boils down to advertisers. If a if a radio ownership group is doesn't have the ratings and people don't want to buy the format, well then it goes away. Yeah. So I I feel like it, and part of the thing too that was interesting, and I I discovered this kind of as as a new artist, you know, was that. Um, the way they would test new music was really difficult uh, as as a, a new artist because naturally our, our human intuition is that we like familiar. We like things that mm -hmm. we already know. So yeah. if you're in a room and they're playing you six hooks from songs and you've got a little device that says, I love this, nah, and you really just, and it's just yes or no, hot or cold, well, what's always going to do well? Stuff you know. Mm -hmm. And if you like it, well, it'll test well, always. But if you're hearing something for the first time and it's 30 seconds of it, nah. Yeah. So just it, that, yeah. I think that's kind of flawed because that's not really a way to, to sample Well, because some music. songs, you know, it's like you like them. There's some songs I've found that, you know, a song that hits really hard the first time mm -hmm. gets burnt out a little faster than those ones that take a couple, two or three times. You start to get really into it. I feel like the life cycle is a little bit longer. Uh, of as far as because the fact that a song can be so hooky the first time you hear it is the same reason why you kind of get bored with or, it yeah yeah you know so it's really conducive to only accepting that kind of material that is really great that first listen you know like it's, you're talking about it's kind of calculated guesswork <laughs> yeah <laughs> well it's, yeah. it's true nobody really knows what's gonna hit and, and right. yeah you it's just business really in general yeah yeah i'm gonna well, make you know grilled cheese sandwiches i don't know <laughs> if these are going to work or be successful but i'm going to try you know it's yeah just, like yeah. you said it's just business in general the harwelden mansion located in tulsa oklahoma is your choice for a luxury destination bed and breakfast stunning and unique beautifully decorated suites await you for your business or leisure Constructed in the 1920s, the historic Harwelden Mansion boasts elegant and comfortable accommodations. Egyptian cotton towels, Peacock Alley linens, and Hermes bath products. All rooms stocked with complimentary beer, wine, tea, coffee, and soda. And you'll appreciate the welcome snack and turndown service, minutes from the world-renowned gathering place. Book your overnight stay at harweldenmansion.com. That's H A R W E L D E N mansion.com. So, was it your first album that it was recorded live and in the studio? Was that number one? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you prefer live, right? Because you really engage, because I've seen you so many times, but you really uh, respond to the audience. Mm -hmm. it, it, I love, uh, yeah, I love that. I love playing to an audience because um, I think music at its core is as an artist, you're trying to, you're trying to communicate something, you know, you're, you're, and as a, as an instrumentalist, you know, it, it becomes a little bit different in that you're trying to communicate just kind of an emotion or a, um, some kind of, um, feeling or you know i like this it makes me feel good you know let have people forget whatever's going on in their life for the next two hours just come in here's play and have fun and that that um there's nothing quite like that because you know you that's what you spend hours and hours and hours practicing and mm -hmm. writing and working on your craft for is those are those opportunities to to play for people and and you know and Anytime you do a new record or you write new songs, you just don't know. Yeah. I hope people like this. Mm -hmm. But I also think that's healthy because if you feel like, eh, they'll love it, 
that's yeah. not a good that's not a good place to be. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Well, and the best thing you can do is just make stuff that gets you excited. You know, it's kind of yeah. I feel like that's your best chance. It's that authentic. Has to be yeah. Personal. yeah, it has to be personal because if it's so true, if it's calculated and and you know, if it's more of a business move, well, I think a lot of people can can see through that in music. Yeah, know? and one thing about you know playing live that you're kind of talking about uh, that I like to touch on is the communal aspect of music mm-hmm. gets lost a lot in in modern production and stuff like that. Uh, it's something I'd like to hear more in production, of course, but it just happens live because there's an audience there, there's people there. It's, it, it becomes this group experience, you know? Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of really cool old records that, that capture that really well, especially when I'm thinking like the Rolling Stones or ACDC or these records that you hear. And it's like you can... You just feel like there's there there were people in the studio. It wasn't just a band, but there were also engineers and producers mm-hmm. and stuff. And there were, it sounded like they're part. Does that partying. replicate the live experience? Yeah, I think versus it, like you can be in multiple studios. Well, I think it has that energy more yeah. of just the the group people experiencing it at the same time and stuff right. like that. Uh, mm-hmm. There's something it, it just happens when you do it live, especially mm-hmm. if they're really connecting with the material and stuff like that. So when you go into the studio. Uh, is there anything that you do differently to the music versus your approach live to make it a little more exciting in that studio environment? Or or what are you thinking differently about when you go into the studio? Well, I would say this, you know, we I've had a lot of different experiences in a lot of different studios, which is which has been wonderful. Yeah. Um, and um, one of the one of the first studios I worked in outside of Tulsa was in the uh, home studio of the, of Jeff Lorber in the Pacific Palisades. Oh, okay. And that was a wonderful, um, experience. I mean, yeah. great studio. He may, he still makes all his records there and he had everything, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, we even did a couple of songs on, on tape, you know, brought out the reels and that, that's an experience that, you know, a lot of people don't don't get to have anymore. I mean, yeah, that's going to change, sure. but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely, we, hope so. <laughs> we love tape. Um, so that that was a that was a really really cool to hear yourself on on tape. Um, but I, I the recording process is so, is so important to me in terms of having the band there or the Christmas record. We had um, a lot of uh, Nashville session guys, but we were all in the studio, the collaborative process, I think, and I get it. I mean, if you don't have the means to be able to have that experience where, you know, it's just you and there's a room in your house and a lot of people do that and that's Mm -hmm. totally cool. You can make some great music that way. But if you have that opportunity for uh, a, a community, that collaboration, you know, because it's like if you have a great idea, what if you have six other people put their great ideas on it? Mm-hmm. It becomes an amazing idea. Yeah, you know, it becomes so much better, and that really can that really happens in a in a studio, you know, in a studio setting because you're talking because you have a framework for a song, you've rehearsed it, it's it's here, and then it's like, well, hey, what if we did this? Or because it always is different when you go into the studio to record it. Yeah, for sure. You know, one of the ones that. Uh, one of the studios that was really great was um, Studio A uh, on uh, Music Row in Nashville, and Studio B is right next to it. And, right. and this RCA. is yeah, RCA Studios, and we uh, we recorded there. We the band and I loaded in the SUV, pulled our trailer of gear, and then we just kind of lived in that studio, and. Um, it was it was where Outlaw Country got its start. Oh, okay. You know, so, so Waylon Jennings had played there. Uh, uh, all these great musicians over the years had played there, and and I feel, I think that there's this there's just a cool a cool thing, uh-huh. intangible thing, to being able to be part of a lineage of musicians that have played somewhere. I feel that way, whether it's a venue that we get the opportunity to play in or if it's a studio. And mm-hmm. I feel like it's just, it's an honor to be part of that. Yeah. And, um, but that was such a great experience because at the time Ben Folds, uh, was running the studio. Oh, okay. 
or it was his, uh, renting it, leasing it, whatever. And, um, he had taken apart a piano and he created a, a tack piano where you put, you put thumbtacks. Yeah. Uh-huh. You know, Leon Russell about, was known for doing that. Yeah, I'm like, this, it's crazy. It's, it's kind of a mad scientist move. It you is. Know? <laughs> a little yeah. bit. Yep. And um, he, uh, we, we just, you're looking around, well, what's all in here? What can we use? Oh, let's use that on this. And so you just, you kind of, you're creating in the studio. Mm-hmm. Well, let's use it. Let's, what kind of a snare sound are we want? Well, let's use that snare instead of the snare we used on the last song. Mm-hmm. So it's just, it's really, it's just really awesome. Yeah, I love studios that. that have just toys, instruments. Yeah, I just love mm-hmm. lots of lots of lots of instruments, weird instruments, anything that might spark something, something. that you never could have thought of. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. Another thing to touch on too about we were talking about that collaborative thing. You know, if there's six people in a room and everybody's vibing on a track, it's like it's so much more likely that that's going to go out into the real world and, and uh, touch other people. Mm-hmm. You know, when you're by yourself. Like when I write a song, every song I write, I mean, I like it. Obviously, that's why I'm working on it, you know. And then other people are like, I don't get that or whatever. <laughs> you know, it's like yeah. sometimes it feels like, I mean, I don't know if this is good. I just like it. But, mm-hmm. you know, but you don't have any confirmation, you know. But if you're in a room with people and everyone's just getting into it, then you have, that's, that's got to be a good indicator. That's like, okay, we're on to something here, you know. Yeah, that, that's very true because when we did our Christmas record, uh, David, John, and I, who is he's my guitarist and we have we've played together since 94 so uh and um he's he's been part of every record that we've done when it when we decided to do a christmas record you know i've really had since i've very since i put my very first record out Mm -hmm. people started asking me when are you gonna do christmas and i'm like i don't want to do that Everybody has a crit. People you've never heard of have a Christmas record. That was the only record they made. Was you know, <laughs> yeah. It's like I don't want to do. I'm gonna that. do a Halloween record. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna do. No, I'm gonna do Thanksgiving. You know, yeah. or or something else. But um, I really avoided it for a long time because I felt like I don't have anything to offer. I don't have, I don't have something for that yet. So so in the back of my mind, in the back of my mind, I was like, I'd like to do that. But it's not. It's not right. I'm not ready. I, I I need to grow or have some inspiration or 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 something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. See, I I appreciate that you just had that thought process. You know, you didn't do what everybody does, which is like, well, Christmas is coming up. Let's make a Christmas record. You know, but you wanted to make wait until you you knew your direction. You knew you had something to bring to it. That's really cool. Yeah. And so it you know it it ruminated for a long time, and then I had some thoughts and ideas and. Um, David and I put all these arrangements together and then we took them to Nashville and Chris Rodriguez was our producer and Chris, Chris is, he produced two of my records and he's, he's just, I cannot say enough about him. He's, he's the, such a nice guy. Yeah. Come on, Chris Gonzalez. Uh, Rodriguez. 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 Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. He's, he's just awesome. And, um. So when you get in a room with all of these Nashville session guys that that are playing with, you know, <laughs> playing with all the all the major artists, yeah, and and you're like, here are our Christmas arrangements, <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, oh, this is great, let's do this or let's do this or how about we make this section reggae? Oh, okay, you know, <laughs> that that was That's very awesome. that was very gratifying because you're like David and I are like. Okay, you know, yeah, because they're they're buying in and they're putting their stamp on it and they're engaged and you know because one our piano player was Michael Lamardian, mm-hmm. and Michael, um, he he he's like won Buku's of Grammys. He, <laughs> he has done tons of Christian music, but he also has you know he played keyboards on New Frontier for Donald Fagan. Oh, he's wow. done stuff with Steely Dan, Christopher Cross. Rod Stewart, Infatuation, uh, She Works Hard for the Money, Donna yeah, Summer. Yeah. I mean, he's, mm-hmm. he's done it all. And I'm like, this guy's playing piano on my Christmas record. That's so cool. And um, he, he lo- it, we just, we had a great time. It yeah. was so much fun. And that was, again, a situation where we were all in a studio for a couple of days, Blackbird Studio in, in Franklin. And we did it in Feb- uh, February, 
and there was snow on the ground. So there was a lot of snow, which made it perfect in terms of just the feel for yeah, Christmas. doing something for Christmas. So, um, but that collaborative process, I, I don't put out songs or I don't put out records as frequently as I would like, but that's partly because I, I want to do it right. And I, I don't want to shortchange it or cut a corner. Yeah. And I, and I like that. Col- I want to be able to be in an environment where I can have that collaborative experience. Yeah, for sure. How do you make money with a record these days? That's <laughs> what I want to How much money do you make? Well, when, <laughs> I, when I find out, I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's every musician's answer. Yeah. Uh, when I ever find out. But especially yeah. now. I mean, where do you see the future going? You know, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, th- I think everything, there's certainly everything is cyclical. Um, but I, I feel like we, we as a culture, and I, I don't know how to put this. It, I feel like we have devalued music's role in our lives. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I'll tell you what I mean by that is that when you think of a musical icon like Leon or Billy Joel or how would you develop one of those kind of artists now? And, and when I think, when I, when I ponder that, it's that, you know, the recording process was different. They had time. They would not go to the studio with the music ready to record. They would write it and hang out in the studio. Mm-hmm. So true. Well, a lot of people don't have that. I mean, you got to be at the, you know, the A level to be able to, to do that kind of thing. But then I, th- I think the, um, the listener experience, I mean, I think it's great that LPs are making a comeback because it's not convenient to listen to a record. You <laughs> yeah. have to, and that's, that's a good thing. You have to sit down and, and listen to it in your home and, and have a listening experience. But I, I remember those days in high school and college where I would just sit and listen to music and I would just ponder it. I would think about it. And we have so many things that are vie for our attention. Mm-hmm. We can't sit still. We're all ADD because we got our phones or this is happening or I've got a notification, breaking news, what's going on? I think until we learn to slow down and kick some of that stuff to the corner, it's going to be hard. Yeah. Because we're listening to music. It's super convenient to access it, which is good on the one hand. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, for an artist, you know, if you can listen to it for free on YouTube or listen to it for for free on uh, a streaming service versus buying it, you know... uh, Someone choosing to buy your music is like the the ultimate form of validation as an artist. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because it's like you've you're taking me home. You're gonna play me in your car. You're gonna play me in your in your house. And yeah, you can do that with streaming and all that. But but I think you have to. I think when you're listening to singles and you're listening to one offs from artists. And you're not listening to the entire work that they put together. And, and some by design, some records now by design are, are basically single offerings. You know, are you going to do an EP and there are six songs and these are all designed to try and get on radio. And I just, yeah. I think, I think you have to spend time with an artist and their whole work to get to know an artist and what they're about. Mm-hmm. Because I think... What makes an icon is there. there's a surface enjoyment of music. I like that song. Who's it by? Okay, I like it. I think that's kind of where we sit most of the time now. Next song comes in. Who's that by? I like it. I think what makes an icon or, or what makes for um, a better relationship with an artist is, okay, I've heard two of their songs. I'm going to get their whole record. I want to hear what makes this artist tick. I want to hear what's their vision. What are they singing about? Is Are they doing some different twists and turns stylistically on the record? 
and then you spend time listening to that artist. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's going to be very interesting to see, will we have icons 20 years from now? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I... Will we have anything? <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, but, the world. Yeah. but I, I just, I just feel like music is so important. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, um, I, you know, I just, when I, when I see some of our, some of the big kind of icon artists who are, have passed away the, the last few years, you know, you think like, well, who's, who's the next Prince? Who's the next Eddie Van Halen? That was a really big one that that really shocked me. Yeah, <laughs> really bothered yeah. me. And I and I and I you know I think the answer is I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know I mean I and that and that's not a you know who's the next David Sanborn? I don't know. You know because they those guys Brady Nichols <laughs> yeah. we know that I, I I know. you have a very that. distinct he has a very distinct sound just like Kenny G but you do as well and I think that's what is important well I appreciate that thank you yeah. I just um you know I love music I love seeing new artists and um it's if I was trying to get started now versus when I did in the 90s it would be much harder because mm -hmm. while Everything is readily available. That's also part of the problem is everything is readily available sure. because you have bukus of of choices. Yeah. And um so it's it's hard to kind of get a collective mass of a following because I think that's all that also plays into becoming an icon. Yeah. yeah. Today's episode is brought to you by the historic Harweldon Mansion, your choice for a luxury bed and breakfast experience, and the church studio, home to your favorite rock and roll t-shirt. The church studio was the Abbey Road of America in the 1970s when Rock and Roll Hall of Famer and Grammy Award winning singer songwriter and musician Leon Russell purchased a 100 year old church and turned it into a recording studio and home office to shelter records. Now under significant renovation to bring it back to a recording studio, entertainment network, and community space. Get your church merch fixed today at thechurchstudio.com. Cool gear includes super soft t-shirts, hoodies, hats, journals, stickers, candles, and so much more. Thechurchstudio.com. And I, I want to touch on, you were talking about uh, getting into an artist and, and experiencing their full bodies of work and stuff like that. And something I... Th think about sometimes is how as an artist you don't want to stray away from experimentation or maybe things that may if you're afraid of anything that might be obscure or might not be a single because we all have that mindset okay how's this song going to work on its own how's it going to pop on spotify when someone clicks on it for the first time or whatever you know if you're doing that you're robbing yourself as an artist of the ability to explore more interesting ideas that you may have but not only that you're robbing your fans because as a fan when you discover an artist, you know, you discover their most popular songs. Pretty soon you want to go check out their album. Pretty soon you're checking out some a weird B-side song uh, uh, that maybe yeah. a lot of people don't get, mm -hmm. but you get it. And so like uh, the thing about a song that's more obscure, it appeals to fewer people, but to the fewer people it does appeal to, it appeals on a deeper level. Mm -hmm. You know, it may not be as catchy generally because there's more material in it. So it's not as catchy, it's not as simple maybe, but that material will really speak and resonate with somebody on a really deep level. That's the way I feel sometimes when I really dig in deeper on an artist and I'm like, you know, you hear some of those songs that's like, you know, I can show it to someone else and like, I don't get this at all, you know, but it resonates so much with me. So it's like, you're really, at that point, you're really getting that really deep connection between you and that artist. Mm -hmm. No, that's true. I mean, like to use Sanborn as an example, um, I, I got his discography and I'm like, I want to hear his approach in all these different settings that he would, be in you know so i anything that had him on it whether it was roger waters mm -hmm. david bowie uh talking book stevie wonder tuesday heartbreak was the song um did you ever hear him on fania all stars on uh, hit me with that again no fania all stars in the 70s i mean that was early david sanborn no oh, you're gonna have so to so good you're have to new york uh musicians um Puerto Ricans, and I, I didn't realize it for a long time. I was like, that sounds like David. And it was? Yeah. 
Oh, that's awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, he just, he, you He's know incredible. instantly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he really <laughs> is. He has a, a pod, well, not a podcast, but a, a YouTube podcast. Uh, yeah. show he's been doing called Sanborn Sessions. Yeah, I love that. Just, it's super cool. It's in his studio, home studio, and he's just bringing people in and they're yeah. playing music and talking about music. And yeah. It's, it's really, that. really cool. Well, I wonder if that's going to evolve to be in and really a niche. I interviewed recently um, Roger Lynn, who invented the Lynn drum. Mm-hmm. And so he, uh, incredible guy. And he, a lot of people call him the, uh, the grandfather of hip hop. And it was, you mentioned Prince earlier. (laughs) Uh It was Prince that really manipulated that electronic drum machine, Mm -hmm. took it to a whole new level. But he's convinced that any instrument can be replicated electronically. And, um, I'm not like you guys. (laughs) I know I, I play the flute and of course the flute easily maybe, but it's like, it kind of breaks my heart. And then, um, I, I don't know. What do you think about that? I mean, it, I, he's a great guy, but I would respectfully disagree with his, yeah. with his viewpoint. I disagree too. And I and I and I it would be very easy because I if you if you line up twelve tenor players or twelve alto players, um, not so much soprano is there a massive tonal difference from musician to musician, but the saxophone is the closest instrument to the approximation of the human voice that we have is the saxophone because you can. You can emote on it. You can get that breathiness that you get from a voice. It it really is the closest thing because what you're doing is a lot of the same things you would be doing is is if you were singing in terms of your your diaphragm and, and air coming out. You're doing the same thing but through a horn. So what's great about the saxophone is you can line up 12 tenor players and they all sound different. Every one of them mm-hmm. sounds different. Their tone is different. So that alone, right. if that were truly possible, you know, you might you might get your computer to sound like one of them, but you're not going to get it to sound like Stan Getz. No way. Uh, <laughs> well, not gonna, not gonna I happen. interpreted Roger a little different because I did watch that interview and, and it's it's one of my favorites we've done so far, Roger Lynn one. But he was talking about the Lynn drum when he invented it and when they got the sound and they sampled real drums and stuff. And he mm-hmm. said, uh, Keltner, Odek. Old yeah, Baker. well, he was talking about yeah. them. He's like, you know, obviously yeah. it doesn't do what they do. We did edit down the video. Though, oh, okay, just okay. FYI. Well, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> that that's the uh, well. The, the main point is that <laughs> the main point he was making is that this machine, you know, it is not really meant to replace drummers because it's used for something t- right. entirely different. You know, mm-hmm. if you sampled a saxophone, it's so hard to play it out on your keyboard and make it sound like a real yeah. sax player. But you might get something just completely different, a weird. If it, unnatural if sound. you're stacking like a horn section you could program something that would sound like a horn section mm-hmm. i mean i think it I, to his point i i think it i think it's about the application could you replicate something that sounds like a horn section well sure yeah you know i mean you, there are devices now that i can key it with my foot and it'll stack me up an octave or, or whatever um so you know i think I think I th- I'm sure his I'm sure his desire was just to give musicians another tool to really make great music. You know, is probably yeah. his ultimate goal because mm-hmm. um, nothing can replace a, a human um, human choice with how they play and the notes they choose. Yeah, never. I yeah, because on a Lindrum, you know, they'll program beats that a human would never play because it like would feel weird and stuff, you know. But that's also why it, it produces different types of material, you know. Mm-hmm. So yeah, the groove will will set you on a whole different course. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. So are you currently writing? Are you working on a project right now? You know, um, I'm I'm working on a, a Christmas show that we're doing at the Maybe Center in a few a few weeks, and um, you know, I'm I'm optimistic that next year there'll be more opportunities to play you know this is this uh um COVID has has been hard on everybody mm. but extremely hard on on artists because um writing via zoom <laughs> or or microsoft <laughs> teams that that's just not the same mm. mm-hmm. um so but i actually am working on it's funny you mentioned that um I am. I haven't decided if I'm going to do it yet, but I, I I'm collecting all of the materials. But um, when Chris Rodriguez was here, 
in September, and we did we did a record uh, we did a concert. I had it recorded or multi-tracked. So I'm thinking about doing a putting out a live record that is a culmination because a lot of my YouTube videos uh, we had multi-tracked so that we could so the sound was good because it, you yeah know, for sure if the video looks great but your sounds through your phone right. that's no good yeah. <laughs> you know so I have I have all of this stuff that sounds different and is different because it was from a live setting and it and it's multi-tracked and we can mix it and um so I'm, I'm really strongly leaning towards putting it out the first part of next year because and I think I think the the uh the marketing piece is here's something that you didn't get to go here for a year <laughs> a live concert yeah right so here's here's a live concert and and I've got material from there's an 18 minute version of a song we did called Tuesday morning that is a Jeff it's a Jeff Lorber and I wrote it but it has Bill Champlin on it on B3 and and Chris from is on Chicago. it from uh-huh. Chicago mm-hmm. and it's just you hear a whole nether side of Bill as a as a because he is just a bad to the bone B three player, and he just goes off. I mean, it's so cool. <laughs> I love the organ, and I think I think I'll let the whole thing go. I mean, it's eighteen minutes, so it could be a double CD. I haven't decided. But you know, yet. we have to get you in the studio, the church studio. Yeah, I wanted to uh, ask you what are you? You've got to be excited about the church studio. I, I am. <laughs> I am thrilled uh, because I. Um, you know, why I love going to Nashville, I had to, I had to, to have that experience. But I mean, to be able to, ha- to be able to have a world-class studio here mm-hmm. and have that experience here, Yay. you know, <laughs> I, I, uh, I think that's great. But yeah, Chris and I have talked from a lot about, you know, starting to write and gather material for an opportunity to to work in this. And you know, you can put out singles. So I know, but I I always I <laughs> so I'm old school driven. putting know, out a I whole am. album. I know I'm I'm old school, <laughs> but I, but I think it's different for a jazz person, you know, because it's a whole a whole different scene, yeah, whole different thing. Um, so I'm I'm excited about. Yeah. We could do the whole video production. Yeah, I'm yeah. I'm very excited about having that opportunity because yeah. it's. You know, we've got some videos on YouTube of our experience in the studios. Oh, we've I know they're in. so good, and um, it's it's fun. It's so fun. <laughs> you know, is that the best place people to go, or should they go to your website to learn more about Grady Nichols? You know, probably the big three would be GradyNichols dot com, uh, YouTube dot com backslash or forward slash whichever it is slash <laughs> <laughs> uh, Grady Nichols fan. And then uh, our Facebook would be great. Awesome. And your saxophone's in the room. It is. It's broken. Did I tell you that? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> is your reed dried up? or it, do you think It's you possible. Can? <laughs> it, could, it could be dried up. But no, I could, uh, I could check it I out. Would, yeah, I would love to. What okay. Think, hey? Yeah, I was going to ask you a couple of questions about it, really, because I, I know one of the things you're known for is your real lyrical, vocal approach to it. And mm-hmm. I was hoping maybe you could show us a couple of maybe those kind of moments that you had where you're like, ooh, okay, there's something, or maybe a couple of specific techniques you kind of found that kind of lend itself to that you phrasing know, and stuff. Um, that's interesting. I I kind of came upon that whole thing, um, you know, as you're searching for an artist, of, as an artist where you're like, what's my, what's my voice going to be? And we, my wife and I met, Tony Bennett backstage at a show he was doing in Arkansas. Mm. And one of the things he said was, what I try and do as a vocalist, I try and sound like an instrumentalist. (laughs) Wow. And I thought, so you're trying to sound like us? Like a (laughs) a sax player when you sing? And I thought about that and I'm like, I'm going to do the opposite of that. I'm, I would like to, um, I, I'm going to play like a vo- like a singer. Yeah. Because, and then I started thinking back. At that moment, that was like a light bulb moment. That was moment. kind of a light bulb moment. Wow. And I, That's incredible. What a legendary person 
to give you that idea, you know, and for you to have well, that and moment. He, <laughs> and the thing is, he would remember me from Adam. We were just two sure. fans backstage. Yeah. You know, backstage. At a, he doesn't at a, remember much probably by now. <laughs> but, he, but, but those uh, are gifts from God, sorry. those little moments that, that make a, a huge impact. And I thought about, well, what is it, you know, what do I, when I thought about the players that I like to listen to the most, you know, um, I tend to be drawn towards songs where there's some where I have some kind of an emotional connection with how they're playing or their phrasing. And so then I started practicing with just basically instead of playing a lot of jazz tunes, I started practicing you know playing along to vocal records. Yeah. Wow. And and uh trying to phrase well how does Sade phrase? How does um Celine, I could jump all over the board. How does Celine Dion phrase? How how does Rod Stewart phrase? How do you know? And just how can I do? How can I take what they're doing and put it in this kind of pot? Pavarotti, I know you open for him. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if you yeah. phrase like him. I haven't really got to that. <laughs> that's <laughs> that a whole would, episode in yeah. itself. That's a whole other thing. Yeah. But um, Eminem. I'm gonna your orders. Yeah. All right. Well. Yeah. So you know. So I just it it has been something that and it's still and always will be a work in progress. You yeah. Know? Um, so I think it's just it's like so if there are notes on a page, how can I play them? How would I sing those notes? Rather than I'm just playing a quarter note or or whatever it is. Yeah. Does that make sense? No, oh, that makes it does. perfect sense. It's yeah. So neat. Well, um, yeah. Okay. Well, let me, let me pop this. <laughs> we see it. <laughs> I'm trying to think of a, of a song that just kind of went in my head. Not Careless Whisper. <laughs> I'm sure you're. I'm sure you're tired of it by now. That's my favorite. I love Wham. I mean, I yeah, love it too. I, I'm for his sake. I'm like, he's probably sick peace. of playing yeah. that by now. <laughs> yeah. Now let's see. Um, Okay, um, I've always been a big Journey fan, so I'll just I'll just play a little bit of, of, of this so you guys can figure this out. Let me just make sure I'm warm here. <laughs> Who's crying now? Okay, good. That yeah. transfers really well to saxophone. Uh, is there a song? Have you ever had a song that was particularly challenging to transfer to saxophone in that way or anything? Or oh, well, a lot of a lot of them don't. A lot of them don't make the transition. Oh, okay. You know, like one of the ones I love uh, is um, Africa. You know. Oh, okay. oh my gosh, totally. Weezer redid that one. Was well, it's really good? one note though. Exactly. So that's kind of the, <laughs> so you that's kind of a problem. It's yeah. killer. So you're like, man, I love everything about this song, but it's like. Nope. <laughs> not sorry. Yeah. No, nope. It's not. That would break the internet though if work. you did Africa. <laughs> <laughs> that would be if I could figure out how to do it, but I just don't think it's one that's gonna another gonna hard work. one. I used to play Benny and the Jets on my flute. Yeah, that's a tough Oh gosh, one. Yeah. yeah. And you're having to wait <laughs> kind of for don't, don't, don't. Yeah. <laughs> and you're kinda <laughs> having to wait. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> you know, so you're like Oh, that's again. awesome. Well, thank you for being here. Well, yeah, welcome. we really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much, so much for fun. having me. I really appreciate it. All right, guys. And yeah, make sure to like, subscribe, drop us a comment. Let us know what you think. Uh, let us know suggestions. If you know a guest you would love to see us interview, we would love to hear about it. And thanks for joining us. Yep. Thanks, Grady. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs>